Welcome to the Digital Health and Innovation Podcast, a publication of the Southern Medical Association. This podcast will educate and inform listeners on the various systems and methods that use information, data, and communication technologies to help resolve problems, reduce inefficiencies and costs, improve access, increase quality, and help make the practice of medicine more personalized and precise. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I'm Andy Moen here, and I'm the co-chairman of the Division of Digital Health and Innovation for the Southern Medical Association. I'm also joined by Ms. Jennifer Price, who's the educational manager for the SMA, and will be joining us as usual for the discussion today with our guest. Additionally, we have brought back Dr. Deepak Mohan as a guest moderator, who will also weigh in on, on the discussion Dr. Mohan is a pathologist and medical director for laboratory medicine at San Joaquin General Hospital in Northern California. And if you all didn't guess it already, I'm sure you're curious, Dr. Deepak Mohan, and I I just don't share last names. We have the same parents, guys. Thanks for joining us again, bro. Anyway, so moving on, today we have a wonderful guest who's a healthcare IT mover and shaker and is going to give us an in-depth perspective on recent important decision made on the interoperability of electronic health record data that has been overshadowed with all that is going on with the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Donald Rucker, for those of you that don't know him, is the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, the ONC, where he leads the formulation of the federal health IT strategy and coordinates federal health IT policies, standards, programs and investments to help the nation's healthcare system become fully interoperable. He was recently named modern modern healthcare's fourth most influential clinical leader and the 16th most influential healthcare leader in the nation. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Rucker and Dr. Mohan. Uh, before I get into specific questions regards to this new rule, I just want to see how your family are doing with all of all that's going on with the pandemic. Various combinations of relatives have gotten to know each other better. <laughs> so there's a social distancing, but you guys are all, what, what do you mean by that, sir? Well, uh, for example, my niece, uh, my sister's daughter moved in with her cousins uh, from my uh, brother's side. So that's actually nice to nice to see. They're, uh, they're, uh, distancing themselves out in uh, Arizona. Nice, nice. And Dr. Mohan, how are, how are you doing? How's everything going with you with you guys over in uh, Northern California? Yeah, I, I heard my youngest utter something I never thought she would ever say. She said, when am I going back to school? <laughs> <laughs> so it might be an indicator of the boredom uh, that sets in. So yeah, we're, we're, we're sheltering in place and following all the, the rules. But um, we do have some cabin fever. <laughs> well, uh, getting to the, the the topic, and I'm glad uh, you guys are doing well and your families are doing well. Uh, they're doing okay during this time. Um, you know, interoperability of healthcare, uh, you know, information systems and sharing that data has been, you know, it's obviously a very big hot topic right now. And and uh, we obviously uh, we brought Dr. Rucker on uh, to share this new rule or these rules that have been put into place to make things easier for patients to control their own healthcare data. Um, so this is uh, this is great news. A lot of it's been overshadowed with COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, so, you know, Dr. Rucker, can you care to explain what the 21st Century Cures Act final rule really is? Sure, yeah. Um, Andy, as, as you mentioned, um, we have been on a uh, national search for interoperability for um, well, at least two decades, uh, depending on how you count. Um, and it is something that I think maybe we all intuited would happen sort of automatically as we became more computerized. But in point of fact, for a variety of business and technical reasons, um, and just the complexity of clinical medicine, that has not been the case. What Congress saw in 2016 with the Cures Act is really, um, you know, is 
you know, what they realized was, you know, we have smartphones, we're getting data on everything else in our lives near constantly, but there's a big, um, as clinicians would know the word lacoon, that's not the way Congress put it, but um, there's a big gap in um, information that, you know, patients can have, right? So patients are really not empowered with modern technology um, in really any way, shape, manner, or form in healthcare. We have it everywhere else. We have choice in our lives on every other thing, you know, where to shop, whether to buy a car, what, whether to buy a house, everything else, we're allowed to make adult decisions. But in healthcare, by dint of um, actually the outgrowth of federal policies around third-party payments that go back to World War II incentives in 1942, um, that has evolved into a world where third parties do all of our, essentially make all of our care decisions or choices on where to get care for us. Um, and we're left really often powerless. And of course that system has become, um, as we all know, monstrously expensive. So the Cures Act is really Congress saying, hey, the American public should have access to their information. And the provisions of the Cures Act are then um, Congress's um, very reasoned approach on how to do this. And that, that law, by the way, was passed almost unanimously, signed by President Obama in end of 2016. And I can say strongly supported and being strongly implemented by uh, President Trump. So with, the, with these uh, rules put into to place, um, how how, is, how are things going to change for patients and providers um, in terms of how this data is going to be transferred? Yeah, so um, if you look today, um, what what we have, and that was state-of-the-art, interestingly enough, just a couple years ago, were, were um, requirements um, under the Meaningful Use Program for providing uh, portals, right, so web portals. But um, the world has moved a lot so so much of what we do and the 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 ability to access it all day uh, you know all the time really sits on smartphone apps and so the cures act um really was a thoughtful approach that said there are two things missing in order to have, there are a couple things present, but there are a couple things missing in order to have apps on smartphones. And it might be worth looking, thinking about what's present, what's missing. So what's present, which was certainly not true when I started my career, um, I was involved in building the first Windows electronic medical record on something called Windows 2.1, which was probably before many people listening to this call were born. Um, but we had, you know, no interoperability with anything. We had a hard enough time getting the printers to work on serial ports and then parallel ports back in the 80s and, and early 90s. So the things that are out there now that make this possible, what's present is high network bandwidth. Um, what's present are is a lot of electronic medical data. Um, and um, what's also present is a lot of compute power. And finally, what is now present, maybe the most recent part of the mix, are um, modern API calls that are used throughout the smartphone economy. So the, the technology is called RESTful. Representational state transfer is the REST part of the acronym. Um, and then um, elegant standards for form, forming the data called JSON, just in general economy, and then the JSON implementation of healthcare is called FHIR, which is abbreviated F-H-I-R for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. So those are the things we have. So computing speed, network speed, um, the data electronically, and the um, application programming interface standards 
to transmit it. So what don't we have? What we don't have is actually um, the requirements um, to actually transmit the data, right? Um, both as a matter of business and, and a matter of technology. That's what we don't have. That that's the case is not really surprising when you think about it. Um, everybody talks about, um, you know, there's no business case. Well, through the, you know, and when you look at that through third party, through our third party payment mechanisms and the whole stack of federal policies that have layered on top of each other, sort of like the seven cities of Troy for anybody who's a scholar of the classics, um, those various incentives now have led to the fact that the best way, the most profitable way of running a healthcare business is to become very tightly vertically integrated um, and to do everything you can to keep patients within you to reach a critical mass so large that payers have to have you in network at your price. That's We see that in many markets throughout the country. And um, obviously in that kind of a world, interoperability and patient choice and consumer empowerment and transparency are not the highest priority. Um, so, so, Dr. Rucker, the, that's a, a great summary and, uh, you know, highlights a lot of the advantages. Um, I do have a question for you. This is Dr. Mohan. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we've been operating uh, under the world of HIPAA, which protects uh, privacy uh, for patients in healthcare. Um, you know, how does this particular act uh, affect HIPAA and uh, and how do we continue to protect the privacy of our, our, our patients? Because we do find, find that to be very important and our patients do say that they would like to have their privacy protected. Uh, how does this act uh, change HIPAA or does it um, uh, alter the way that HIPAA works? Well, a couple of things there. Um, so, First of all, the act doesn't change HIPAA at all. Um, it actually um, operationalizes the HIPAA right of individual access, which historically has just been go down to medical records and get your chart or photocopy of your chart. So it actually operationalizes HIPAA. So it really it um, makes HIPAA possible. Um, I think in terms of what the public wants, I think you know there there have been some interesting polling that patients. Um, right advocate organization has done polling um, and pretty clearly people want their data and in fact are willing to take reasonable risks. The big issue for the American public is transparency and understanding the blisteringly high costs of health care. That's the priority. Um, a number of folks have tried to frame this exclusively as a privacy issue. Um, but you know, when you look at that, it often there seems to be a, a very tight mapping between uh, folks with non-transparent business models, and at least in Washington, in the lobbying world, folks who are lobbying on that point, they never lobby on whether the public should have the choice of what to do with their data, um, as opposed to you know having that choice be made by providers or payers, um, the public clearly wants themselves to be the people to choose what to do with it. In terms of technical things, which is I think the other part of your question, so the, the modern computing stack actually allows, there's something called OAuth2, which allows, um, it's a robust authentication protocol, authorization protocol. It's, you have used that, anybody who's done online banking, for example, you know, you you deposit a check online. You have used that system, and um, though you know, obviously, it was relatively transparent to you. So, what we've done in that, uh, so the patient, um, this is not one of these end user licensing agreements we click through every day on the internet. This is something where the patient has to use very explicitly, give access to an app. Um, logging on to the provider portal with the passwords the provider gave them typically in a face-to-face -face visit in the office um, would that be the typical way of authenticating so it's a very explicit choice we put in provisions that the um, the provider portal 
can um, provide the privacy policy of the app, or if an app does not have a privacy policy, um, to let patients know and to warn patients in detail that you know they are now uh, responsible for their information. We've done that in a way that makes it enforceable both by the Federal Trade Commission and in a number of states by various um, causes of private action. So we put, um, you know, we put some enforceability into that. That type of enforceability is what um, the FTC used to fine Facebook five billion dollars, um, with further further violations being um, making um, Mark Zuckerberg criminally liable. So um, we think there's some teeth there. Very interesting. So from a patient's uh, perspective, and kind of to make it more in layman's terms, you have, I'm, I'm assuming they're going to have an app, and this app is going to integrate or interface with uh, a specific EHR vendor for whatever their, their primary care provider uses or, you know, their hospital uses. Now, let's say that, that they're, they're at a hospital or a PCP in LA and they go to New York, something happens to them. That app would have all your healthcare data and you'll be able to interface with that portal over there if you go to a physician in, a, in another state that's on a different vendor. Um, does that question make sense, Dr. Rucker? I'm just kind of, I want to bring it down to a patient's level. It's see how, how well, it, it not only makes sense, it is precisely the thing yeah. that we want to have, right? right? It's precisely the goal here is that the patients can aggregate their data. Now, obviously right. over time, authentication mechanisms are going to vastly improve. So it won't be the, you know, remember your password kind of thing that the world we live in today, that's right. moving pretty rapidly. Um, but it is precisely that the patient has what um, is in control of their information and they can take it with them. Um, you know, I've moved a couple times over the recent years. Um, I had to get tests redone, same test. The only reason they did it is because, you know, they were, you know, they couldn't really get access to them. Um, and so, yes, that that world is going to change. That's probably the very first thing you will see as these APIs roll out. Um, I think then there will be phases of things patients will see. I think the next phase will be apps that really analyze what's in the clinical records, offer suggestions, make sure that it's understandable by patients. Um, I think those apps will also probably bundle in price transparency information in various ways. But ultimately, the smartphone is not, as we know, just a phone or even a computer, but it can be our central network for devices we hook up to it. Now, there aren't a lot of devices, but even today, there are things like digital scales. I'm sitting here at my desk. I have a um, ultrasound machine that hooks up to my smartphone, my uh, smartphone. Um, so I want to ultrasound somebody, um, right? Digital stethoscopes. Um, you've seen the Apple smartwatch with um, heart rate monitoring. So I think we're going to see that um, in the not too distant future, because these smartphones are so powerful, that the very nature of care will morph. And that evolution starts with having clinical information. If you're just trying to do health care and wellness and fitness without clinical information, that's hard. I mean, you know, you can do the Fitbit, you can have a diet app, but certainly for sick people, um, it is, it's a totally different experience if the apps have um, deep knowledge of what your medical issues are. Um, we think there's going to be new forms of care. Obviously, one of those new forms is being accelerated as we speak with telehealth during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, Health and Human Services, um, our agency, we've put out rules um, on um, increasing reimbursement for telehealth to make uh, doctors be able to provide that um, in, the same, in the same way uh, that they would be providing office visits and get paid the same amount. Um, we've clarified, um, you know, HIPAA restrictions on 
things and, and loosen some of that, the Office of Civil Rights to uh, make sure. So we're seeing literally in, in you know, the weeks we live in here, um, how rapidly this can morph um, in the right circumstance. And obviously that whole, the pandemic makes it clear how important it is really to have modern application programming interfaces. So things can hook up without us physically having to drag our butt into uh, you know a doctor's office or a hospital. And this is uh, you know this is kind of leading to this uh, this question um, in terms of so patients will have this they have this app on their phone. How are they? First of all, what kind of authentication process? Uh, and there's I'm sure there's some rigorous authentication process because it's got their health data on there. What is that? process and what is the standard uh, based upon this rule that's number one and then also how do you protect this i mean you have you have all these different apps what is this specific uh cyber security element or um minimum uh, uh, security uh, piece that you need to have for something like this to be protected or under the uh, under the rules is there something in there uh, within the the uh, the, the, the cures act that states something yeah, I I think there's, I think when you look at security um, or security policy, I think there's two things to look at. One um, is that the electronic security in the design, right? So is data encrypted? Are there, what are the protocols? Um, that's one. And then the, the second issue, um, and that is pretty robust, pretty modern and is is i would say um well understood um obviously it's a rapidly moving field so things morph but it's well understood i, I think one could say the second are the privacy policies right the secondary uses of data um the first we're really dealing with through um you know the protocols and the second we're dealing with by the requirements um as i've outlined that when the patient is making the choice to give their data to an app, that the app's privacy policies are, or lack thereof, are presented in an enforceable way. So that's the policy. So now let's talk about um, the reality. So the reality is that patients know their medical information is sensitive information. And I think they're not going to just, you know, the, the American public is smart. They're not going to just willy nilly give this away. Um, and we know that because other things that people value highly, like their money, right? You don't just bank with somebody who drove a pickup truck across the street from you and claims that they're a bank, right? You go right. with trusted institutions, right? You don't put your retirement accounts in, you know, in just some random person who told you, oh, here's my retirement money, right? You use brands and trust um, to do that. Is there any actual reason to think that people will be materially dumber about um, this trusted information than other? Um, I know a lot of people claim that, but I don't think there's a whole lot of data. Look, everybody can say somebody, you know, lost all their money obviously or whatever but i think as a matter of course um the risks there are small what is not discussed in these conversations which is critical is what are the not theoretical risks but day-to-day -day reality for an american public that has no transparency into their health care costs or effective ability to shop we're spending 20 percent of our gdp on healthcare, there's half a million medical bankruptcies a year. People, what people really need is the ability to shop and have the discipline of markets um, in um, their lives, the, the same way they have it in every other part of their lives. So that's what, that's the overwhelming need that absolutely is the priority of the American public. Um, I mean, don't forget when you, are put into medical bankruptcy, you know, your employer knows, you're going to the court, you know, you have to take time off from work. Um, you know, those things sit in court dockets. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff here that is very anti-privacy in the way we do things now. So um, I think we have to balance the risks and the rewards of all of this. I think what will happen is it'll be a combination of current players who are going to have to act more like consumer friendly businesses um, and compete, right? Because apps, you know, level the playing field and make it national. Right now, um, providers have been able to, um, you know, they have not really been threatened by distant competitors, right? Mayo Clinic is not really a threat unless you're in, you know, Scottsdale or Jacksonville or somebody or, or Minnesota. What's suppose Mayo Clinic, they just hired John Halamka as their head of digital. You know, what suppose they had a higher range of virtualization throughout the country. Um, so I, I think the, the way to look at these issues are really look at it, not from edge protection cases, but look at it from what would the consumer want? What's consumer empowerment? And what risks and rewards would accrue to consumers from them being in control of their data? I think when you look at it that way, this discussion is framed totally differently. The, um, you know, Dr. Mohan, in terms of uh, this new rule and, and what you've kind of learned uh, from the discussion, how do you think this is going to help your, your practice as a, as a lab director? Well, you know, there are several caveats that I, I mean, certain concerns I have, I, I would say more than caveats, more concerns. And, and some of those are that currently the way that our uh, reports and, and, and other uh, um, information pieces are generated, they're meant for providers. They're not necessarily meant for patients. So I think as this becomes more prevalent, our reports probably will change and we may have more of a patient-friendly report, which may be good, but that is not a change that has taken place yet. You know, our reports typically have a lot of jargon, then they're basically, uh, you know, intended for the uh, for the provider. So, uh, the, you know, and change is good. I mean, a lot of people are afraid of change, but I'm, I'm one of those type of the people. If, 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 if change is, is there and it makes a difference for, um, um, basically, what business are we in? We're the business of making people healthy. If, if potentially, we, and I see a lot of potential here. A couple of the drawbacks I do see, um, and it is really the privacy. And and you know, Ms. Dr. Rucker definitely addressed a few of those issues as far as people will try to do the best they can. But if you look at some of the breaches that have taken place, even at some of the large um, credit agencies and other things. You know, it's a little bit scary because, you know, uh, we we try to live in a safe world, but, uh, you know, there are hackers out there, you know, China and other places. And, uh, you know, I don't know what our health information in the in the hands of uh, others really, what's the dangers there? Uh, I haven't really thought about it. And there might be, there might be some dangers. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, the, the, this is one of those things. Uh, as we enter this new world, we will discover uh, more of the downsides and pro probably some of the upsides as well. We'll probably see a lot of different things as, as uh, Dr. Rucker pointed out, uh, use of uh, AI and other tools to analyze the data. I think that's that's going to be a, a, a field which, which is going to probably be, uh, you know, increasing over the next uh, five to 10 years as the data becomes more available. And um, I'm very interested as a scientist to see what that artificial intelligence uh, uh, can bring to us. Uh, but I am also uh, cautious and concerned as a physician because, you know, our first tenant is to do no harm uh, is uh, the possibility of this information somehow harming the um, uh, the, the patient uh, is, is a, pr a privacy concern. As we know, even the um, uh, certain things that we now uh, have gotten from the uh, Obama uh, Act, um, the Health Care Act, uh, as far as um, uh, pre-existing conditions and other things, uh, they're still not settled. In fact, there are a couple of court challenges on that. And if we go to back to a world of pre-existing conditions, this will definitely be something that could be a concern. I mean, if you look at what has been done in banking and entertainment, in travel, um, in, you know, publishing, 
um, these things become radically transformed. Um, and I think the arbitrage opportunities um, to transform healthcare are probably even larger than in those industries. Great points, uh, you know, Dr. Rucker. Uh, there have uh, there have been, uh, and this is a question that I have. There have been some uh, concerns raised about gag clauses, um, so the in inability of providers to share their EHR screens uh, to, you know, if there's some usability, safety issues, whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, I've, I've worked a lot of healthcare institutions, uh, you know, on implementation, so on and so forth. I've, I've seen a lot of providers um, share their screens without their technically being any safety or usability issues. Um, how does this final rule address that? How is it going to uh, alleviate that, you know, that issue or that those specific gag clauses that could potentially be in there? So the Cures Act said that um, communications about the use, the usability, the patterns of use, there are, I think, six or seven classes um, explicitly in the Cures Act um, that um, providers shall not be hampered in communicating about that. Um, and so there's, there are really sort of, uh, you know, the challenge here is enabling that, but yet recognizing, especially with things like screenshots um, or video, recognizing the property rights um, and the intellectual property of the developers, right? So there are two competing public goods here, if you will, right? One, the right to um, have a safe work environment for um, patients and providers, um, and the other to be able to um, reap the um, economic rewards of um, building software and taking the market risks out there. We've um, balanced those two. And so um, in the rule, you're allowed to share screenshots, but it's only the minimum amount necessary to make a very specific point. So you can't just share all the screenshots and say, ah, I don't like this software. Um, ditto for video, since video is of course a sequ sequence of screenshots. Video, if you're doing video, which again can expose additional tranches of intellectual property, there you have to meet a test of that, um, you know, there has to be some temporal behavior that you're illustrating with your screenshot. Um, we feel that that's a, um, a very reasonable um, and uh, legally defensible boundary um, between the various rights involved. Interesting. Uh, these screenshots, and I, I, you know, I was thinking about a, another specific question from a patient you know, perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And I think patients are going to, just for them to understand, or people that don't really get in, they don't get into the granularity of the, the actual tech and how it works and functions. So you have an app. Mm -hmm. Let's say you go outside of the country. Is that that healthcare information, is that going to be accessible if I go to, uh, let's say, France? Is that something that we're going to have it so you can access the portal or whatever it is? Or is it going to be on the app itself where you download your information? Or do you have to well, access multiple portals? Well, um, right now, with the authentication we have, each app, an app would have to access each portal the patient wants to put information from that for whom the patient wants to prove what, put provider information into the app. I think yeah. in the not too distant future, when we have more robust authentication mechanisms, that all will change. But at the moment, that's the technology. Then it is simply a business functionality decision on right. what data you store on the device versus what data you um, store on the network. Yeah, right. That's is... that's that's just an issue for you know. That's an issue that every app has to deal with. Um, and you know that's the usual questions of. Uh, you know, managing data, latency, right. complexity, um, you know, um, timeliness. I mean, those are just all of the issues of managing 
data wherever it, wherever that data sits. Dr. Rucker, I know your your time is very valuable, and and we of course we thank you so much for for being with us. But I want to see if we can get a um, a pearl that you can give us um, before we end uh, this discussion today. Something that maybe relate to COVID nineteen um, and uh, this these rules that you you were talking about uh, in terms of the the Cures Act. Um, something something interesting for us uh, for our well. It, so many of your listeners. Um, are spending more time at home than they ever dreamed they'd need to. Um, and probably everybody on this call, and obviously a lot of people are hard at work um, out in the community getting us food and shelter and transportation and security and clinical care, uh, most importantly, uh, in, in these high uh, risk days. So, you know, salutes out to the people who are um, you know, undergoing real risk in some cases, um, you know, material risk. Um, but, you know, as we sit in in this world, just imagine if the interoperability rules, both the CMS and the ONC rule, just imagine if they'd come out five years ago and we would have seamless electronic information. We might even be able to enter in, you know, testing at home. Um, the the world we're struggling with today would be a lot simpler, um, a lot more straightforward, and a lot less anxiety provoking. So um, I, I think this these circumstances really highlight the opportunity of modern computing environments, distributed computing environments, and computing environments where the um, patient and the public are. Um, in charge and responsible and you know that will help not just for acute things but frankly for chronic illness i mean the whole business of chronic illness i'll go visit the doctor every three or six or 12 months um you know we have now so much that we can do um sensing on phones to um make chronic care continuous as opposed to episodic i think that alone will be transformative so those are a couple closing thoughts excellent excellent um those are great closing thoughts uh dr mohan and and uh jennifer do you guys have anything uh, to add no i think it's going to be a very uh, intriguing subject uh in the course of next few years and i really want to see uh what comes out of it i know that there will be some positives but we'll also have to endure the negatives. And, you know, many of these things, the, ho the hope is that the positives outweigh the negatives. And I think that's going to be the case here, too. Uh, as as uh, more and more of our data has been shared uh, with Facebook and others, we, we, we have seen risks. So I don't think we can discount the risk completely, but, uh, but there has been positives from that, too. Well, uh, the, thank you to thank you, Deepak. Um, I just want to uh, take this time to thank uh, both you and uh, Dr. Rucker for joining us uh, today. Jennifer, thanks a lot. As usual, a great discussion. Uh, so interesting. Uh, it's been overshadowed with uh, all that's going on, but uh, just an amazing, uh, amazingly important rule um, into the addition of uh, our, our uh, the, the interoperability of healthcare systems and the access of patient data by patients themselves. Consumers are gonna, uh, they're gonna have the power of this data, which is gonna be amazing for all of us uh, going into the future. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. All right, thanks. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. To subscribe to additional podcasts, visit sma.org slash podcasts.